So uh, we're talking about the ILVK Upper Colorado River Irrigation and Restoration Project, um, a project on the main stem of the Colorado River. Um, the main thing you're probably wondering is what does uh, the ILVK stand for? Um, these are my neighbors, some pretty interesting characters. Uh, I've got to work with them pretty closely over time. Um, the truth is I, I don't like reading from slides and, and this is up on your screen. If you'd like more information about Senate Document 80 and others, um, you know, we can send this out. But basically, um, when the Colorado Big Thompson project was constructed, um, they knew that the peak of the hydrograph was going to be cut off. So many of the ag producers in the lands of the vicinity of Kremlin, so ILVK is irrigators of the lands in the vicinity of Kremlin, um, they knew that the fields would no, num no longer naturally flood within the riparian corridor. Um, and so they granted water rights that were associated to them. Um, so we're very tied to the Colorado Big Thompson project um, and what it means um, for all of us. So it includes mostly irrigated land on the main stem of the Colorado. It does include some water rights on the lower Blue River um, as it confluences with the Colorado and then also includes some water rights on the lower Muddy um, as it confluences with the Colorado. Um, but it, it bound us, Senate document, Senate document 80 bounded us together forever. Um, so here's a little map. Um, that demonstrates the, the different pump facilities. So these aren't all of the different irrigation water rights that are associated with ILVK. Um, <clears throat> there include some on the blue and, and then like I also said on the muddy and additional irrigated lands out of the KB ditch. Um, if you can, not sure, probably see my mouse on the screen. Um, true ILVK includes all of this irrigated land, basically the entire uh, Colorado riparian and then also all of this going down towards Gore Canyon and, and this on the lower blue. Um, but to just give you an idea, we are right around the Kremlin area. So if you've ever driven in this valley, uh, you've probably seen those odd wood structures that are placed haphazardly. The land is so flat down there um, that when they build most of the project, most of the water rights uh, were actually tied to fixed station irrigation pumps. Um, so the Bureau of Reclamation came in, dropped a fixed pump in, um, built a bunch of different irrigation delivery systems, largely elevated ditch systems, but the, the soil base down here is so sandy as it's kind of the, the taper of the valley floor as the Colorado flows into Gore Canyon. Um, that's kind of an interesting design to consider because uh, elevated ditches with uh, that were built primarily out of sand have equaled um, some challenges over time. That project and, and what our river looks like, I think that um, <clears throat> many projects, uh, you know, alter flows in the Colorado River in this stretch of river. Um, beyond just the Colorado Big Thompson project, certainly uh, many Trans Mountain Diversion projects, and then as well as a, a number of different reservoir systems. But I think that pretty much until the early 2000s, uh, the landowners really never felt um, some of the uh, the full force effect of what could happen uh, based on altered uh, river flows. Um, 80s and 90s, relatively positive uh, hydrology and the river system function and worked. Um, but you can tell that bank there in this photo looks oddly tall relative to the water table. And that's exactly what all of us producers experienced um, in the drought of the early 2000s. And so we were looking at flows that were significantly less than they had historically been at high flow for irrigation systems um, and, and many different impacts to the river system. So uh, these are inlets to one of the fixed station pumps in the project area um, at that low flow in order for these to operate at 80% efficiency or better. Uh, they require being submerged by at least 18 inches of water or more. <clears throat> um, and you can see here, this is a springtime irrigation with the top of the pump inlets um, sucking air. So uh, the system was not working at that low flow Colorado River. Um, <clears throat> this would be an example of, uh, I would call it a temporary check diversion that was uh, put in the river to backwater up and elevate to the pump system. In the background, you can see one of those wood structures where the pump inlet sits up in this area here. Um, and, and this was done um, out of great uh, care and attempt uh, for the producer, um, but not a lot of thought processes of what it would happen you know, to the river with its installation um, and it being temporary. And you can see here on river right, um, clearly it had failed pretty rapidly. Um, this is the uh, the mighty Colorado River, uh, the Grand River, um, at a low flow there in the, the stretch of the early 2000s. Um, pretty sad to see what's happening, you know, very low water table, hard for irrigators to access their water, and then you can imagine what we're talking about with water temps at a river that's flowing that low. So 
what we we did we were able um northern and, and denver had their collective firming projects um on windy gap and, and moffett collection system um going on in the mid 2000s kind of right as the tail end of the the hardcore drought up here um was hitting home so grand county was pretty aggressive in early stages of stream management planning and and I don't think the topic of this should really focus too much on Grant County stream management plan, but based out of necessity, Grant County pretty much came in and said, we're moving forward with this plan. Um, we want to engage as many stakeholders as possible, but we don't have enough science and data to really accurately reflect um, potential changes to this river system and what it means scientifically. Um, you know, we can talk about what additional depleted flows mean, um, you know, emotionally or you know, as a matter of uh, visual impact, um, but more science and data was needed. So Grant County got very aggressive at it with it. If if others would like additional information, um, it's available on Grant County's website, and I'd be happy to forward that link to Phil and Aaron um, to send out. But what was a, a great thing for the the producers down here of the ILVK is that that study um, gave us enough information about the river system to start thinking about this river more as a of a connected system um, than just individual private property areas um, and then also diversion systems, uh, whether they be ditch or pump, um, that we knew that, you know, this river functions as a system and in order to have any kind of proper uh, fix or repair to it that I think that our approach to evaluate it as a system um, would be better. So as everyone knows, you know, this takes uh, a long time uh, to build trust and relationships to work on these kind of things. So while this was going on in the, the early and mid 2000s, um, it took a long time for these landowners and producers um, to be connected. I, I should have said there are 13 individual landowners of what are considered um, ILVK water rights. So the 13 different producers um, within the system um, make its whole. Many of them have multiple diversions, but it's it's 13 different landowners. So what we were able to do is basically take a look at Grant County's uh, stream management plan, um, piggyback on the information that was learned, what science and research had already been studied and was ongoing being monitored, and then be able to evaluate our system a little bit more efficiently and effectively um, to understand what it would take for repair. So within the project reach, um, I would say a little more than 50% of the producers were we're primarily concerned about their ability to operate their ag diversions and, and their agriculture way of making a life. Um, many were balanced in both is a great care for that, but also recognize um, the need of the health of the river. Um, you know, the river wasn't just failing for, you know, our diversion structures. It was kind of uh, coming unraveled um, as we speak. And so Phil mentioned my background, but um, I was fortunate to have a, a fly rod in my hand at a young age, but um, out of financial necessity, um, I started guiding right after school in uh, 2003 to supplement my income. That's where my parents have always been really proud of me um, because I cho chose to be a, uh, a cowboy and a fishing guide to earn a living. My, my wife isn't overly impressed sometimes. Um, it's a great way to make a living though. Um, but so with that, uh, in 2012, the landowners had finally uh, bonded together enough to approach uh, the Colorado Basin Roundtable, and we asked for $50,000 to give our kickoff assessment. So knowing what work had been um, completed for Grant County Stream Management Plan, um, the Roundtable uh, voted yes to the grant. The landowners put in 54,000, and we had $104,000 river assessment um, for a lot of miles of river. And it, it was intended really to understand more of the global picture and the systematic approach to the river it wasn't intended to um, you know have 100 percent design of, of restoration efforts for what was necessary but at least you know for our get it, uh, for us to get our hands around it in, in a in a format of an assessment um, but it was really the first time historically that the producers of the ILVK had come together and never had any kind of a victory which I find um, to be amazing my family had to relocate up here uh, from the front range um, right in the year 2000 but many of these producers, are on the same ranch, you know, multi-generational up to four and five generations. Um, and while different projects had aligned their interests in past history and they had worked together on certain things, um, in many's eyes, there, there had never really been a, a moment of victory for these producers. Um, they'd kind of been working independently um, within the river system. And so with that grant, you know, one of the first things that um, we identified working with Grand County Stream Management Plan is this is a hydrograph of the Colorado River at the confluence of Troublesome. So that's about 
three and a half to four miles upstream of the town of Kremling, um, main stem Colorado River. You can see here that historic peak flow, uh, well over 6,000 CFS and post uh, firming projects for Denver and Northern. Um, this is what our river was uh, kind of slated to look like going forward. Um, and all of our irrigation infrastructure, I would say was built for somewhere in between, um, not necessarily what was the historical peak, um, but I don't think that anyone thought this would be down below 1000 CFS. So this is a beautiful photograph that I pirated from an unnamed individual that I have never given proper credit to. And I apologize for that. He's probably seen it in one of my presentations. Um, but this is looking upstream uh, just past Kremlin. Um, coming in from the north side here is the confluence of the muddy. Coming in from south here is the confluence of the Blue River. And then this is the main stem Colorado River going up valley from which it's in Kremlin. So just a, a nice kind of landscape view to take a look at some of the land that we're talking about participating in this project. Um, so we're back to this good old photo. We had started the river assessment. I would say at the point in time this happened, we were about halfway through and we had one of the producers approach us and say, um, basically, if we did not find a way to um, have his pumps function properly um, by the following construction season that he was gonna find a way to do it himself, um, which historically landowners um, had used everything from chain tires to you name it, um, to back up water, divert for the pumps. So that put the engineers and I at a great moment of struggle. Um, we left that producer's property that day, uh, came back to our shop, which if none of you have ever been here, um, things like this are known to happen from time to time. But we sat down with a 30 pack of PBR and agreed that no one was leaving the shop until we had a plan for that producer, um, which made for an interesting evening. But we were basically, this is uh, the exact location of where this diversion structure was. Um, this particular diversion structure functions for three different water rights. Um, it's a it's a three pump system out of the same hole. And um, that night, I think this is the sketch we actually made that night um, in the shop. But part of the research from the river assessment had indicated that within a quarter mile of this particular area, um, there was a stone fly count done in 1980 prior to the construction of uh, the Windy Gap project. And there was a, a riffle that was studied about a quarter mile from here um, that was a productive riffle that had an abundant stonefly population. Present date, it's hard to even picture what a normal functioning riffle looks like um, in this stretch of river because it's mostly sandy bottom, very little size uh, river substrate cobble, um, basically a sand pit um, with very tall banks surrounding it. And part of what the river assessment concluded was that um, the river has been enticing basically for the last hundred plus years. So part of the research indicated that there was a, a very large meandering oxbow of the Colorado River um, that was cut off by one of the producers um, to allow that producer to gain access to their land. So it ended up shortening the length of the Colorado River by about a mile and a third. Um, that propagated a head cut. So the river was kind of eating itself alive, trying to find its happy balance of uh, length and, and um, uh, slope uh, during that time. And so it kind of, the water table over time just kind of kept eating itself down. So the theory with the engineers became, well, <clears throat> if we know we want to elevate the water table again, that's going to do two positive things. It's going to submerge the irrigators pumps. Um, it's going to create some additional habitat. And then also as a byproduct of this, you know, the water table shouldn't be that disconnected from the surface where we all try and produce um, our hay crops from. And by elevating the water table, there's a, kind of a less of a sponge in between the surface uh, where we were flood irrigating primarily and then um, where the water table is located. So that turned into reality and this is um, riffle number one post-construction. Um, we learned a couple of lessons in the construction of it, but in a river system system of this size, it was, uh, there, there were some model of the riffles that had been done over time. This one looks a little bit different, um, but it was kind of our first go. Riffle number two, um, came a year after this one. And what has happened now is a series of five different water diversion structures or riffles um, that helped to re-elevate the water table to what it historically was prior to um, the removal of that oxbow that shortened the length of river by so far. And what you can see in this photo that's so incredible is that um, you can instantly see these banks look like the photos where I showed you before prior to construction where it wasn't this vegetative connectivity um, between the land and the water prior to the construction of this, which this diversion structure actually elevated um, the surface water of the Colorado River here by about 22 inches. Um, 
And so the water table went immediately back up to the vegetation. And the aftermath of this with five of them working together within about a five mile stretch of the river to work on elevations is we've seen a remarkable connectivity from the vegetation back to the river where we had planned a number of locations um, of additional bank stabilization and stream restoration um, that really by elevating the water table became unnecessary based on how um, it was connected. So I would say we learned a lot from doing number one and it was a little bit uh, properly permitted and went through the process, but it was a little bit cowboy in the beginning because this landowner wanted to be so aggressive um, in working on the river system, um, but it kind of proved to spearhead and launch the whole project in a greater capacity um, because of what was done here. And so this riffle now, um, we study, monitor it. It's been, this will be its fifth season um, in the ground. Um, basically every rock has a GPS coordinate and a name. Um, we study what it does on the tail out of it as far as water depths. So within a riffle, it's the same as any grade control structure for a diversion. Um, within this photo, I should have been a little bit left of where I am, but the three uh, pump system sit just upstream um, right here on river left. <clears throat> but we uh, designed this riffle after what was agreed with uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, aquatic, local aquatic biologists to be some of the healthiest existing natural riffles in the Colorado River as far as its width at low flow, its width at high flow, um, its slope, and therefore its velocities, and then also what that ends up creating for scour depth at the tail so that the project was designed primarily to function as a diversion structure for the irrigator, um, but also to see how we could create a, a man-made structure that might act as a naturally functioning riffle to bring back some of um, the aquatic habitat that used to be there, both as far as um, what happens with the river, but then also macroinvertebrates and in and, and a glorified way of saying it, fish food. Um, so we have been um, incredibly impressed with the project. My screen is stalling, I apologize. Uh oh. There we go. Apologize, but so this is the uh, <clears throat> this is part of that three intake system um, in the before photo before the grade control structure. Uh, same uh, flow of the river. This is what the pump system looks like in the after. Um, so you can tell how dramatically we increase the elevation of the river there for those particular pump systems. Um, and with that, I imagine I'm speaking primarily to ag folks, so you guys know as well as I do, but um, you know, this is uh, important for all of our heritage and what we do to make a living. Um, we need we need uh, abundant supply of this. Um, this is the great aftermath of this. This photo is taken specifically on that riffle um, within the first year of its existence, and it was actually less than that, about nine months. It had one of the most abundant golden stonefly hatches of anywhere on the Colorado River system. and we've kind of tend to refer to this project a little bit as the field of dreams that when we've created the platform um, for quality things to happen, if you build it, they will come and they have showed up quick. Um, this riffle system now, um, not, not an intent of the project to begin with, but my family, <clears throat> um, the fishing business that we operate, we actually lease this producer's land now to run as part of our commercial fishing operation. So those sand pit photos of what you saw in the before, um, we actually operate it now as part of our, paid commercial fishing um, and the production is there as far as trout fishery um, to work. That's one of the uh, byproducts of the riffle. And then you know what we all do, um, back to the same cause. And so this is where what's been so neat during the process of this project is while I said in the beginning, you know, over 50% of the producers were, were much more focused on their infrastructure and, and whether it was uh, specifically to a diversion structure and um, assured supply of water delivery to, uh, to their um, diversion systems, or many of the ditches that were constructed as, as part of the CBT by the Bureau of Reclamation um, were in jeopardy, had failed, in jeopardy of failing um, within Washington to the river because of so many of our steep eroding banks. And so the bank stabilization portion, you know, was very significant to, to secure landowners um, proper irrigation land. So. But in the end, ultimately, this is what it's about. And then what the great part of this, uh, one of the producers in the beginning um, had told me that if I ever mentioned the words trout unlimited back to back on the ranch, they'd run me off their place. 
Um, that producer now is on the brink by maybe three o'clock this afternoon of signing their fourth contract uh, with Trout Unlimited, um, acting as a fiscal agent um, to the grant that they received um, to work on some of these issues. I think there's been kind of a change because the goal really with working with Grant Opportunity was that um, for many of these producers that couldn't afford to build, um, you know, healthier river systems um, or a healthier river system, um, and really just to protect their agriculture, we tried to bring in the grant dollars to support that where what maybe was a little bit of a lower dollar model of a restoration effort um, to support their, their agriculture, um, we kind of upgraded the level of that uh, restoration effort to both service to upgrade their agriculture infrastructure necessary for um, their productivity, but then also to address the health of the river within that, that hydrograph at the beginning of this presentation a big gap in water to flow down every year flushing flows um, what it means for velocities and everything else and so essentially part of the river project by bank stabilization and other efforts is to kind of build the river within a river um, we know that this stretch will, will still have uh, flood flows and in, in positive snowpack years uh, especially multiple of them back to back um, but we also know we can see years uh, summer of 2018 uh, the last week of May and the first week of June, uh, that hydrograph that indicated above a, a 6,000 CFS annual average flow, the Colorado River hovered between a 135 CFS and 142 for two weeks um, when a, in a typical year we were seeing our peak peak flow. So we're trying to create a river that functions, um, you know, with a very adjusted um, flow to it. I had to throw this one in. Uh, this is my daughter in the hay field, and I happen to love her quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> But we're pretty excited, but that was kind of the kickoff start to it. Um, we still have all these problems. So if you tour about 12 miles of river down here, this is essentially what it looks like, unfortunately. Um, eroding banks, this particular photo is taken in a location where one of the um, irrigation laterals literally um, sitting in the river. Here's an example of that bank and, and some of the engineering drawings that we have to restore that, including uh, tow wood matrix, um, and then also using root wads to buffer Another example of <clears throat> what the stretch of river looks like in, in the before. Here's some examples of the details of the, the wood matrix. Um, for those of you interested, again, I'm, I'm happy to share all these things. Uh, this particular grant um, was an award that we received after the initial roundtable grant. Um, this was from the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Um, at a total of $465,000 matched um, exactly at a one-to-one -one by the landowners. Um, so landowners definitely have plenty of skin in the game. Um, they're working on this as aggressive as their finances allow them to. But that upgrade is kind of what we see as being able to create a, that healthier river system beyond just uh, buffer and protect the agriculture. So these are, are all um, uh, CWCB cost shared drawings. I'm happy to share them with anybody. Um, there's nothing too special about them. But this one right here um, in particular is, is what was neat, uh, where we got to at a, at a time and place. Many of the landowners, um, they say, you know, why would we put wood in the river when we have access to rock? You know, rock is a lot harder and more durable. Um, not necessarily recognizing some of the habitat benefits uh, to the system and also producing the same end result um, for what we were looking to do. And then this would be the engineering drawing details of some of the root wads. Uh, we had access to some, some flat rock. So this was slightly modified during construction, only that we were using a little bit more slabby flat rock um, rather than, than more round glacial move boulders. Um, and this is the, the end result in the aftermath. Um, we cannot believe um, the positive impacts it's had to the health of the river system. There formerly was a ditch when you're looking at this photo that had washed into the river that uh, the landowner could no longer push some irrigation water to one of their meadows. Um, that ditch has now been moved off the river by about 50 feet plus or minus um, with the bank restored like this to put um, less of the seep water in the ditch impacting the saturation of the bank that was potentially aiding and likely aiding um, in some of the riverbank erosion. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, the irrigators back to irrigating their land in full capacity and um, the river in this stretch, we, we narrowed the channel with um, appropriately based on 3D modeling for a present hydrology. And just so all of you know, we, we work with very smart engineers. That's not me. I'm just saying what they say. 
Um, but we work very closely with the engineers on this for what it means. So this isn't haphazard, you know, how far in, out into the river any of these root wads and rocks are placed. Uh, basically at a minimum flow, low flow river, um, we're looking to see a certain river width and then still allow for a greater uh, river width at a, at a high flow so that we're not choking the floodplain um, as high flow events would come. So this has been a great example of, of an incredible win-win. Uh, this stretch of river parks and wildlife was gracious to us um, and started doing um, a fish electric count uh, for purpose of scientific study in the before and after. Uh, we have four years of data now with these fish um and what they're doing and, and localized while the project has not directly impacted all 12 miles yet while the water table has from the grade control structures and then we've kind of chipped away at different pinch point projects um, over the last four years as we can uh, both based on budget and window of construction season to build um, but the localized improvements of fish populations that have occurred on a scientific level is is mind-blowing um, so it's not just fishermen encounters um, and what's happening there, it, it really is also scientific based on um, account from our local aquatic biologists. And that, is, as we hope, it goes back to the field of dreams as you build some of the simple habitat that they like to have. Um, and they show up, you know, both food source, holding water and all those things. But I think it speaks well. Um, we also do a macro invertebrate count, um, working with learning by doing. Um, a partnership here in Grand County uh, between Transbasin Diverters and local and river district and everybody. Um, we piggybacked on on their macro invertebrate counts. So we do three different macro counts within the stretch. Um, I'm pretty proud to say the riffle that we constructed um, last year's macro count done in the middle of September proved to have three quarters of the total population of macro invertebrates um, as the healthiest functioning natural riffles in the Colorado River. Um, so that would be a location where prior to construction, you're looking at basically a zero macro count um, to within uh, four at that point in time, four years of construction, um, it's got two thirds the amount of bugs that anywhere in the Upper Colorado has. So, all those sp things speak, you know, scientifically well to what we're doing, and you know, beyond just the encounter of it. Um, with that, uh, to get to some of the exciting stuff, and I'll and I'll roll through this pretty quick. But once we were rolling with the CWCB project, uh, we knew there was a, a project need here um, where Windy Gap is located. So the Windy Gap connectivity channel. Um, in the attempt to fund that over time, so we bound together and applied for a regional conservation partnership program. Um, so that is a three-phase project that includes uh, the bypass, now, now referred to as the connectivity channel um, around Windy Gap, and then uh, the habitat restoration project, which is paid for and funded essentially by Denver and Northern, um, but then managed by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, most of, much of that land is through a uh, state wildlife area. And then the ILVK project were the three components of the application. And, and this is what we were awarded um, to go to work. So um, we were incredibly excited. It kind of was the right timing for us because we had built in enough of our pilot projects that we had the confidence to continue moving forward um, you know, with addi additional projects. We certainly knowing that you know, we're taking a look at working on 12 miles of river, didn't want to build anything over aggressive and wanted to take our time Here's kind of a backed out map to understand the Regional Conservation Partnership Program and, and what it means to the entire system. Uh, Windy Gap is clear here upstream by the town of Crim or by the town of Granby. Um, and then we roll through hot sulfur springs. All of the blue here is part of the habitat restoration project. And then the green and yellow down here at the lower end is the ILVK project. So in total, it's impacts uh, are, are over 30 miles of stream system in Grand County, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so with that, I'm going to roll into a short little video segment that was not professionally done, ranch or done. Um, but this is uh, just kind of a series of before and afters. And I'd like to get this point of the, the conversation pretty casual. I think kind of the visual speaks for itself um, where you can see restoration efforts having occurred um, and, and how the rivers come from it. But um, last year, um, through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program individually, uh, we constructed a little bit over half a million dollars of river projects. Um, you know, river construction is a little tricky up here because we pretty much go from frozen ground to uh, a little bit heavier river flow that makes construction tough to irrigation season and then working into fall, um, trying to avoid, uh, you know, critical spawning areas um, and working with Parks and Wildlife on the timing of year of construction. All of those things so it seems that you know over time we kind of have a shorter season of construction um this bank is 
a really good example of what so much of this river looks like. And it's not just the bank that looks sad or, or the poor fence or the poor power pole that's about to fall in, but the, the width of the river through here um, and what that does to water temperatures in the, the heat of uh, summer season um, can be devastating. And, and this is all flowing into Gore Canyon, um, one of the state's most popular recreation sites um, on the upper Colorado River. And so being able to, to look at projects like this and then see successful outcomes to them um, has been re remarkable and only positive things to say um, our original and ongoing continued thanks to the round table and uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board because they got all of this going for us. Um, but then um, as it kind of spun onto the NRCS uh, through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, um, allowing you know projects like this to be built um, for producers at an affordable way, this particular bank, um, this landowner has, has evaluated some form of bank stabilization efforts to protect their meadow um, and their irrigation uh, for four decades. Um, and this was constructed last fall. Really pretty simple, um, <clears throat> nothing mind blowing. The elevations are more specific than you might think for a bank full uh, water table to really encourage uh, vegetation growth. Um, some root wads here that you're seeing as, as we're kind of scrolling through. Um, but uh, the outcome of all this, so this is the same bank and it was the day that I was videoing. I still don't know if I broke the law or not. Um, but I had never seen otters in this stretch of river. And this is literally, I only showed up there uh, to get the after drone shot. And you'll see swimming in the video here, uh, three different otters working all the rocks. And it made me a little bit sad because I'm sure while I was watching them, they ate a lot of fish. But at the same time, you know, it's kind of already showing you the we're back to the field of dreams is you build it, you give fish a place to set up and place they want to be. And then, um, you know, uh, wildlife is, is telling us what uh, the aftermath was here. So it's pretty incredible. I, I did call our Parks and Wildlife District uh, wildlife manager to make sure while I was flying the drone, I was not violating rules. So I think I'm still in the clear on this one. Um, this was a, a cool project in our, our first um, in its totality of last year. Um, so this is two neighbors, as you'll see in these screenshots. Um, but there's a corner of a neighbor's property that, that goes into another, and then there's a diversion structure that impacts water rights out of the KB ditch uh, for six different producers. The KB ditch, a little more glorified than a push-up dam, but not a lot more. Uh, basically, it had to pile up rocks back on the, on the diversion structure every year after any kind of a high flow. i um, never really proper, properly studied or, or understood what was going on with the diversion structure, but then the shape of it also was causing all this bank erosion to the downstream neighbor. And what could have been a situation with neighbors working in opposition of each other um, for an established project, the RCPP really allowed this to be a systematic repair, uh, multiple, produ multiple producers working together um, on each side of the fence you know, to address their issues. Now, individual contracts, of course, um, working as standard equipped contracts with the NRCS, but um, really the outcome of this is, is pretty outstanding. That water depth going against the bank in the, in the before condition you know, a couple inches tops. Um, and then we pushed out the river, you know, just enough to create that, that low flow channel that we want to see um, as far as overall river width. Um, this particular irrigator is changing his system because there formerly was an elevated ditch right on, on the bank. And then this is just upstream of that. Um, the next video will connect all this, but this is the before of the diversion structure. Uh, KB ditch irrigates with 65 cubic feet of water per second. Um, and this is kind of what we dealt with every year. Um, my family irrigates out of this ditch, so all too familiar with it. <clears throat> and then this is what it looks like in the post-construction. Um, this particular shot, <clears throat> if you look here, we really evaluated um, velocities and slope uh, for, for fish movement within the structure itself. The primary point of this project is the water surface elevation here to assure uh, dependable water supply for irrigation facilities. But it's that side channel, the left side of your screen, but would be river right coming downstream. Um, the elevation of the structure um, assured certain flows through that side channel at low flows to even ensure um, migration of juvenile sculpin, which is the, the kind of the toughest velocity to hit with any kind of a diversion structure um, for fish. And sculpin are a native fish um, up in this area, uh, mostly fish food for trout. Um, but still, so now you can really get a view of that side channel. So we took a look at a project here, you know, impacts to six different irrigators. Um, I'm sitting about uh, less than a quarter mile from the structure right now. It wintered very well. I'm excited to see, hopefully we get some water flow this year on it um, to see what it does uh, during a high flow. 
Um, but just uh, in general, you know, all these put together back to back, you know, combinations of different funding resources and partners from Trout Unlimited acting as our f fiscal agent uh, to funding uh, provided by the Basin Roundtable, Colorado Water Conservation Board and the NRCS all of a sudden is built not only what I consider to be a, a really great river project that I hope we're taking kind of appropriate steps to um, as far as the speed at which we're building, we're, we're learning as we go. So we're not trying to do the whole thing in a season. I'm um, trying to take our time with that. <clears throat> um, but then also, you know, this has grown to something, you know, much greater than that within the level of trust um, that these producers have. So um, with only a handful of minutes that I want to continue talking all of your ears off, I'll, I'll make it pretty short, but um, through uh, the demand management work groups uh, for Colorado Water Conservation Board, I'm on the Ag Impacts work group. Um, and then I'm also on the work group for the Colorado Basin Roundtable, um, focused on demand management. Um, conversations came in a long time ago from Dr. Perry Cabot, um, who works for Colorado State University, that while a lot of research and study was done for uh, the Sister Con System Conservation Partnership Program and others, Grand Valley Water Users Association, that there really was a, a pretty significant gap in data and in-field research associated with uh, conserved consumptive use um, at higher elevation, perennial irrigated ground. <clears throat> and so um, we started making some phone calls based of the request of the Ag Impacts Work Group and then led um, the charge by the Basin Roundtable um, to see if we could get some acres of participation to, to study the stuff that Dr. Cabot feels is really necessary and, and very helpful to the Water Conservation Board during the feasibility analysis of demand management. And a handful of phone calls uh, later, we, we had Dr. Cabot's desired 1,500 acres of irrigated ground willing to participate in that. Um, many of these producers, most of them are ILVK producers, um, there's a level of trust that exists with them. Um, they've, they've been contracted with Trout Unlimited before. They've received grants from the CWCB before. Um, they understand how important our water supplies are to us. They know what it looks like when we have depleted flows and, and low flow conditions that have negative impacts to their ag operations and their overall production. Um, and so we're in the process of signing some of those contracts as we speak. It's a much more detailed project than that. Um, and I look forward to ongoing dialogue, but I think I'll let uh, Phil or Aaron jump in here and make sure I'm not talking too much. And if there's a couple more minutes, I'd be happy to expand on it. But um, I just feel very privileged to have worked uh, with uh, the group of partners that we have and uh, most especially the group of producers um, and feel like uh, we're doing good things here on the upper Colorado River. And probably more important than everything, anything is, you know, looking at it as a as a system, but also looking at it as a community of, of ag producers uh, with very similar needs. Um, and then, um, you know, an environmental resource that we recognize that the more we work to protect it, there's a way to do that um, and balance our ag operations. So with that, I, I thank you all. Uh, look forward to questions and Phil or Aaron, let me know if you want me to, to roll for a couple more minutes, but I wanted to give some time for question and answer and, and not bore anybody more than I probably already have. That's perfect, Paul. Uh, and I, you can tell, obviously, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot more to this project than you had time to really go into. Um, I've got a number of questions, but before and if we have time to get to mine, I wanted to make sure we address the, the ones that our, our folks that are, that are viewing had. And I see we've got four. I can't see the specific questions. Uh, Aaron, can you see the four questions that have come in? I can. Um, the first one was, did rising or did raising the water table create any salinity issues in the field? No, for those of you that maybe can't see my face, um, we're looking at all this stuff to make sure that we haven't caused any negative impacts. And I think that something down there um, to that we certainly considered is that it's not that we altered something um, in a way that it wasn't historic. So the speed at which that head cut was working up the river system in the particular location where we started this project, um, that incisement, it really only happened over the last couple of decades. So really by re-elevating to where we were kind of modeling history, um, but we were fortunate that there have been uh, no, no negative impacts really all the way around um, with anything that we've done. And in fact, uh, the reconnectivity of uh, the vegetation within the riparian corridor has been pretty remarkable to see. 
Thank you. Um, how, how have native fish species responded? How native do we want to go here? So um, the Windy Gap connectivity channel is really one of its top priorities is it's, it's kind of a, a mind punch that when you go upstream in the Fraser River and Colorado River from Windy Gap, because that's right where they both confluence, um, sculpin is by far the most abundant fish uh, per acre per mile, however you want to cut it up. And I'm, I'm not a biologist, so I don't want to get too deep here. Downstream of Winnie Gap, there are very few sculpin to find period. And in fact, it statistically is almost a, a giant zero. Um, so our hope in bringing all of these projects together that true native fish um, can thrive. Uh, we have a handful of native suckers in the area. Um, unfortunately, the bulk of our sport fish uh, population, uh, rainbows and browns are, are not natives, but the natural fish population is, is maybe where I'd go with that is they've responded incredibly. I mean, our fish counts are, are up um, so significantly from what they used to be. They've been around a long time and, and um, so not, not influenced by any kind of stocking efforts or artificial input of them. Um, they are loving the habitat that we're building. Thank you. Um, here's another one. We are doing a restoration of a small creek. I was wondering if the same impressive benefits with the ripple you saw could be realized on the small creek. I think 100%. <clears throat> I think that careful evaluation, <clears throat> you know, of, of what that river system looks like as far as slope and velocities, you know, would be necessary. Um, but really any kind of a system that needs additional cobble, um, you know, it's an interst interstitial space in the cobble where macroinvertebrates thrive with the oxygen is, is why riffles are kind of the food machine of the river system for fish. Um, our riffles, what I, I failed to, to mention is that on the surface, they look like pretty small cobble. Wow, that's weird, you just chucked a bunch of cobble in the river, no big deal, but the foundation of them, um, that first riffle that we built, the, the base of it, and now we are talking Colorado River that can peak over 6,000 CFS to so keep that in mind based on the river system. But um, the foundation of that is it's keyed into, we went uh, four feet deep into clay, 14 feet wide. The crest of it is over 10 feet wide. Um, there are over 1,200 cubic yards of three foot average rock in there to build the foundation. The cobble is kind of the top dressing. That's what we created the slopes and elevation with. And when we looked at it, building a foundation or core of that kind of magnitude, we saw as being ultimately permanent for the diversion structure. The cobble top dressing, depending on what happened based on flows and ice, um, a pretty simple maintenance item to add to if necessary. Um, but there has been no need, uh, you know, four, four years plus going on here. Um, it's really kind of adapted well, but I would strongly encourage it. I mean, if it's a river system, regardless of its size, but it has similar characteristics, um, it has done wonders. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another one, any notable impacts, effects, observations from reaches between riffle reconstruction sites? For example, you didn't treat all 12 miles. Have you seen the river eroding between riffles that causes any alarm? Uh, no, it's, it's really the opposite is that our project plans have been minimized um, at bank stabilization efforts between riffles um, due to the reconnection of the water table. So the, the vegetation in mostly um, a completely natural way um, has come in in a capacity where, you know, I have $12 million worth of construction drawings um, in a 30% design sitting on my computer. And um, I think that the, the end project will end up being less than a third of that um, for the, the processes in between because healthy water table vegetation is reconnected and is thriving. And I think, you know, part of that too, is we all have to take our own role. Um, you know, ag, ag is my uh, meat and potatoes of my financial life. Um, and it means the world to me, but, you know, we, we can't, you know, pretend that some of our own activities don't have impacts to this. So, you know, promotion of some of the revegetation of the river system instead of ignoring it, you know, on our end has been a critical part of that. We've done a lot of willow uh, stake replanting um, um, and, uh, and others activities and, and every one of our, you know, construction sites really promote the reveg process. Um, but it's, it's actually performed 
wonderfully. And I kind of feel like some, some extent, the longer we delay in some of this, uh, the less money that we all have to spend because uh, the river's doing it for itself. Okay, and this is the last question that I have for from the chat anyways. Um, did you say colonization of macro invertebrates happened the next season after the restoration project was complete? I'm curious if the macro data is available and was it shared with the data sharing network? Yeah, and I believe it's available through both Grand County's website and Learning by Doings. Um, I'd need to do a little bit of homework to make sure that I accurately get that information, but our macro counts are available um, along with all of Learning by Doings. I'm pretty sure there's links to them on both uh, those websites, but I, again, I need to confirm that. Um, the recolonization definitely happened that quick. That riffle was built um, November um, of the year before, and that uh, golden stonefly hatch occurred the first two weeks of July uh, the following year. Um, it was absolutely mind-blowing to see, and, and really even for um, aquatic biologists, I was out there with uh, John Ewart during um, the golden stonefly hatch. It was remarkable. We kind of took a tour up and down the river system looking at different, you know, populations of goldens, um, and because of the timing that one, we don't, we don't have a specific count on the goldens. That was a, a visual the, the count came um, mid-September, you know, in the total macro count, um, but specific to the golden stoneflies, it was, it was remarkable. So, I mean, I think that that's November to July is, you know, eight, nine months. It was, it was absolutely remarkable. So, Paul, uh, I guess if Aaron, if that's the end of the questions, I've just, I've got a couple more and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so I wondered, uh, what's the timeline on the Windy Gap, Windy Gap bypass of the connectivity channel, and what are your expectations downstream once that gets completed? Well, <clears throat> you know, evaluating this as a system is a pretty interesting thing because when we take a look at it, if you if you take any particular one mile of river, um, you know, from Windy Gap all the way down um, through the ILVK land, over 30 miles of it, you know, one particular project or a one-off project here or there has specific and localized benefits. But when we take a look at it and, and a little bit hesitant to get into it as I'm not a scientist, but that if the connectivity channel can lower water temperatures by a little bit, if it reconnects not only macroinvertebrates and fish to the river system, um, but also some of the crucial sediment that it acts as a sediment block uh, within the main stem right now, and then you go on downstream through the habitat restoration project and the projects that they're planning and looking at there. And then you look at the ILVK reach. All of a sudden, there's enough of them um, that when added together, um, my hope is that this actually looks and functions like a very different river here in the years to come. Uh, timing on it, uh, Northern has been wonderful and continuing to work through all costs associated with engineering. Um, this winter, they, they had a little bit of a hiccup. They, they were doing some uh, soil testing work <clears throat> that got slightly delayed. Um, as far as RCPP, um, construction is intended to begin um, 2021 uh, with final engineering plans done this summer, um, construction 2021 and 2022. And we're hoping that all of this added together uh, is a really crucial thing. Uh, former county manager Lurleen, you know, she always words uh, Windy Gap as the uh, linchpin of the Colorado River and it, it's specific to Grand County and I would certainly agree with that. So I guess, Aaron, if we don't have any more questions, I guess this will be my last one. Just kind of uh, from a broad perspective, Paul, you've been involved in this for several years now. And I think you've been, I think I read you've been attending meetings now for about 17 years on this subject. Um, so you've kind of been around the block and down the block and through the side alleys on this issue. I wondered um, two things, I guess, number one, what are some of the biggest challenges you have faced getting to this point and then the second is and related what advice would you give to other ag producers and other water stakeholders around the state that are looking at what you guys have accomplished and, and want to do kind of something similar uh what advice would you give to them well <clears throat> sad that it it takes a moment of realizing what your future can be um that that doesn't work uh for the way that we all make livings to bind us together but that, that is what it took. And so, you know, us all coming together after looking at this river system from, you know, about 2001 uh, through 2006, 
uh, ch change was necessary. Um, we all we all knew it. That that wasn't a debatable conversation. Um, I would say, you know, one of the greatest challenges, you know, f for this is patience and timing. Um, everything in water is slow, um, and whether we're talking about, you know, permitting uh, relationships with neighbors, you know, all of these things, and that um, no one likes to hear that slow and patience is is the right path. But I think when it comes, you know, to these kind of resources to protect ag. I think that they are the right words um, because when you know when we have a local uh, way of trusting each other, when we've built partnerships that we know that we can rely on, uh, when we know that you know we're not facing this stuff as individuals, yeah, I would say that it, it builds strength in people to see progress and you know producers that I never would have dreamed um, you know installing root wads on their bank to help stabilize it and, and create some juvenile fish habitat um, are loving every minute of doing it now, but it's it's taken that 17 years of, of trust and relationship, you know, to be able to get there. Um, and so p patience and trust is, is my tip and buy your wife lots of flowers for all the meetings you have to go to.